miles away from that target. And just remember looking down at the ground, thinking, this plane is going so slow. And I kept pushing the throttles as far as they would go. It just wouldn't go any faster. And I remember uh, my Bean and I looked at each other after we uh, had about an hour's worth of silence on the way back to the boat. We were both white as ghosts. And that was the one time we didn't think we'd make it back, but uh, we did. Flying during the day was not the preferred mission of intruder crews. Unlike the high-flying B-52s, intruder pilots did most of their attack work at low levels, well within the range of Iraqi anti-aircraft artillery. Because of this obvious danger, the intruder does its best work at night. Not all the Navy's carriers were located in the Persian Gulf. Intruder pilots deployed from carriers in the Red Sea flew exhaustive night missions over Baghdad, which often lasted over six hours. Baghdad was a heavily fortified city, and the greatest security bestowed upon intruder crews was the protective cover of darkness. However, as most naval aviators will attest, the most difficult challenge came not from Iraqi guns, but rather the long trip back to the ship. For us in the Navy, the mission doesn't stop once we're out country. Uh, with our air base uh, being in the water and being very movable, we don't know where it is when we come back. First, we have to find that. And after going through a tanking evolution again, uh, when I came back from my first strike, for example, uh, after going through this tanking, bombing, tanking evolution, uh, six hours later, it's now four in the morning, we're coming down to land with a boat, and my pilot had what a lot of pilots do, have a bad night, and he ended up boltering seven times. Uh, kept coming down the ship and missing the wires just barely each time. Uh, got down to the point where we had a low fuel light come on. He uh, had to launch a tanker. We had to tank again. At this point, one of our generators wasn't working, so I had to illuminate the uh, basket uh, with my flashlight while the pilot was trying to fly it in there. So he's under more stress. Seven hours have gone by at this point, and we just want to get the thing down on deck and go home. Uh, after all this finally finished, we finally got down on the deck. We both just went down and sat in our racks and just were very quiet. <laughs> didn't say much. Uh, just the stress didn't stop just leaving Baghdad. It just continued on, just trying to get back to the boat itself. Despite all of the challenges faced by naval aviators and the deck handlers, the first days of the war were a total success. At all levels of operation, morale was running high. Live television coverage provided the world audience a play-by-play -play account of a seemingly one-sided war as smart bombs hit their targets with remarkable precision. Then came the inevitable. We heard that an A-6 got shot down, and it was an East Coast A-6, and I knew that I had a very good chance of knowing uh, the people that had been shot down, and we weren't sure if they had been killed or not. And then when they released the audio of the, uh, of the prisoners, I recognized the voice immediately of the uh, bomber navigator who had been shot down. And then they showed, uh, the next day they showed the video and he just looked terrible, you know, from the ejection and from uh, whatever he was subjected to as a POW. And I remember thinking that uh, we had gone through some, you know, very introductory training into uh, what prisoners of war may go through uh, if captured. And I just remember thinking that he was going through that and, it, you know, probably lots, lots worse. And uh, it, it really brought it home to me, and all of a sudden, it wasn't a, uh, some kind of game on television anymore. It was very, it became real personal. Fear of being shot down is paramount on the minds of all aviators flying into harm's way. But for the naval aviator, it is only one of many uncertainties. Their ever-moving airstrip can itself be a more difficult target than any Iraqi bridge or Scud bunker. With zero margin of error, the naval pilot must put hook to wire with an accuracy greater than any of the laser-guided technology at his disposal. The war in the Gulf was the first combat experience for most of the men who fly the A-6 intruder. However, combat is nothing new for the aircraft itself. In fact, a quarter century before the outbreak of the war in Iraq, naval pilots of an older generation were flying the intruder over a dangerous land far from home. In June of 1965, the USS Independence was making its way around Cape Horn, through the Indian Ocean, and on to the unsettled seas off Southeast Asia. As the utmost extension of U.S. foreign policy, 
the carrier battle group was again en route to provide what diplomacy could not. All the information on the board here. All right, now we'll get into of the, the several squadrons the aboard the Independence, VA-75, the Sunday Punchers, we'll held a unique distinction. The they were the first squadron to fly the U.S. Navy's brand new state-of-the-art attack aircraft, the Grumman A-6A Intruder. Most of the men in VA-75 had previous experience in older A-4 Skyhawks and A-3 Sky Warriors. So for them, the new assignment was exciting. The Intruder was the most advanced aircraft aboard the ship. The heart of its electronics was the digital integrated attack and navigational equipment, more affectionately known as Diane. The plane's sophisticated interior seems in contrast to an airframe that looks more like a tadpole than a naval attack plane. But the intruder airframe was designed with a purpose, tremendous strength and weightlifting capability. This sturdy body, coupled with its sophisticated electronic guts, provide a devastating combination. And on July 1st, 1965, the USS Independence steered into the wind and the intruder was put to the ultimate test. All intruder attack missions in Vietnam involved many other support aircraft. The Grumman E-2 Hawkeye kept everyone aware of the presence of unwelcome MiGs. Any MiGs in the area became the responsibility of the mighty F-4 Phantom. The intruder has absolutely no air defense capability, making it highly vulnerable to attack from an enemy aircraft. Therefore, an intruder never flies into combat without fighters in the vicinity. Many unfortunate North Vietnamese pilots would soon realize the Phantom was deadly proficient in this role. So proficient, in fact, that not one intruder was ever lost to an enemy aircraft. For all naval aviators, crossing the beach is the most symbolic stage of any mission. They are the fullest extension of naval power attacking always from the sea. Part pilot, part pirate, they come ashore, taking the land by storm, only to return to an unlikely sanctuary that is their home upon the sea. Even when a naval pilot finds his aircraft crippled, he will make every attempt to get back to the safety of the ocean, where he can be assured that his fellow sailors will pick him up only minutes after he hits the drink. As the intruder hurtles toward the target, the pilot must already be considering the most important step of all, crossing back over the beach. intruder missions were carried out against highways and bridges just south of Hanoi. It was clear from the beginning that North Vietnam was a dangerous place to fly. Well-entrenched anti-aircraft artillery was a constant threat, especially to the low-flying intruders. To make matters worse, the Sunday punchers had to deal with a variety of other problems. The extremely hot temperatures and high humidity had an adverse effect on the plane's electronics and radar reliability. This problem was aggravated by the inaccuracy of the early maps of Vietnam. Some of these early maps were as much as three to four miles in error. However, the most serious problem faced by intruder crews in the early days of the Vietnam War was related to the separation of the bombs from the bomb racks. The mechanical bomb racks had a devastating tendency to ignite the bombs while still under the wing of the plane. This problem had to be fixed immediately and was resolved with the addition of bomb ejection systems built by the Douglas Company, but not before three intruders were lost. 
Donald V. Becker, now a rear admiral in the U.S. Navy, was forced to eject when a bomb exploded under his wing in July of 65.